السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم My good students, today we have uh, slides. Okay, you can see now. Uh, yeah, this is of our uh, uh, master, it's uh, Dr. Khaled Malik. I have a PhD in linguistics. I have started this uh, forum, YouTube forum, and Facebook forum to guide the students freely. We have three videos on applied linguistics. Uh, that's BS uh, English Linguistics, Chapter 1, Societal Multilingualism. This we have to go today to discuss uh, seven questions about it. Okay, this chapter has this chapter one and seven question about it. And uh, the first lecture I discussed the service of BS English linguistics. Today we are going to start our first chapter. Oh, that is about multilingualism. Let me share the screen and then you can see. Uh, okay, the slide can give you better understanding. I hope so. Uh, you have now good understanding with me. I hope so. I thought I think you can now see the slides. This is a Pi Linguistics group, okay, by me, Dr. Khaled Malik, UJ Pi Linguistics. This is a link for YouTube, this is a link for Facebook, okay, for this chapter one, Societal Multilingualism. There's, uh, it has uh, uh, seven questions. First question is what is socio so societal multilingualism? The BS English Linguistics Paper 1, Emerging Trends in Social Linguistics. It's an elective subject. Most of the students, they get it when they have English Linguistics. That's the base, that's where they get it. Course code is ELL416, okay? According to HEC, Higher Education of Pakistan. So, if you can see here, I've given these links because some of the students uh, on YouTube, they are complaining that they they are missing, they are waiting for lectures. And I found them, they, they are on the previous lectures. So this means they are not, um, they are just you know, YouTube, they open and whatever they search it. But if you can subscribe, you can get every new video which is uploaded, uh, a message of every new video. And also, if you subscribe, automatically the videos will come to you in, in all orders, okay? And you can find your videos for BS because I have videos for Apple English Linguistics, I have videos for MA English, videos for BS English Linguistics, videos for BS English Language and Literature, and also videos for PhD Viva, MPhil Viva, and PhD Studies, okay? Some videos are on the research also. So you can find out yours if you subscribe from this link which I have pointed out, <coughs> okay. So chapter one of <coughs> the first paper of BS English Linguistics, Emerging Trend in Social Linguistics, Chapter 1, Societal Multilingualism. So that is actually, I have given at the field here, it is one of the, it's an order I gave it. That is actually, you are studying now social linguistics. Question is, what is societal multilingualism? So you are studying actually uh, social linguistics, okay? So social linguistics has focus and content, language choices. When we talk about language choices, there is multilingualism. Among the multilingualism, uh, under multi multilingualism, there is society bilingualism, okay? So what is society by bi societal bilingualism? Societal bilingualism or multilingualism denotes the characteristics linguistic situation in a particular speech community that is in particular society or nation which more than one language is used in this connection. We can further distinguish between official multilingualism and de facto multilingualism. The former indicates that the use of more than one language in a speech community is officially recognized. The respective languages are acknowledged by the nation's constitution and therefore have the status of an official language. The letter refers to the difference between what is officially stated and what is official actually linguistic situation in a nation, for example, officially monolingualism and bilingualism speech communities, <clears throat> other languages without official status are also used. This makes these communities, in fact, 
multilingual in nature. Canada is bilingual. And multicultural also. With the official languages, English and French, however, there are also other languages used in this nation, I mean Canadian nation, which are not officially recognized. For example, the indigenous languages of Inuit and Indian citizens. Therefore, Canada is officially a bilingual nation, while it is de facto a multilingual country. Likewise, Switzerland is officially a multilingual, bilingual, multilingual nation and officially documents for the entire country are written in French, German, and Italian. Each canton, however, has its own official language and is a rather monolingual environmental to grow up in. This information I have taken from was adapted by Klein, who has written this information in 1997. The term bilingualism and multilingualism used in connection with the linguistic characterization of our particular speech community are neutral terms in that they do not imply hierarchy. A difference hierarchy is from your grandfather, your father, you, your son, your grandson is called hierarchy. A difference in <clears throat> social status or between the languages used in this community, this is different when uh, diglossia is considered in diglossic communities, the language varieties typically differ in prestige. The gun variety being the high variety, it's called X variety. Another variety being the low variety is called L variety. So the next, uh, you can see here, now we come to, we can see social linguistic focus and content, language choice, we have already discussed uh, multilingualism, I mean the societal lingualism, and now diglossia, what is diglossia, the second question. Next one, we have seven questions today for this chapter. Diglossia is a linguistic phenomenon found in many multilingual speech communities. Diglossia, diglossia, describes a particular type of social linguistic situation in which there is a clear differentiation in function between the languages or language varieties used in the bilingual or multilingual community. One linguistic variety, the high variety, X variety, is the prestige variety, generally a standard variety, and is typically reserved for official functions in more formal speech situations. In the public sphere, for example, in government, in written education for religious service, or by the media. The other linguistic variety, the low variety, L variety, is exclusively used in and restricted to informal speech situations in the private sphere. The L variety usually has less prestige than the H variety and is made of the vernacular varieties used at home for informal everyday conversations. This specialization of function between H varieties used at home for informal everyday conversation, this specialization of function between H and L is seen as the most important criterion for the classification of a speech community as diglossic. While H is appropriate only in formal situations, L is only used in informal situations. H and L differ from each other, both linguistically and socially. Linguistically, they do so with respect to grammar, phonology, and vocabulary. Socially, they differ in function and prestige, as well as in literary, heritage, acquisition, standardization, and stability. So far, if we consider diglossia, the concept of diglossia was given first in 
1959 by Ferguson. Then the same concept, concept was revived by Fishman in 1967. So now we have to see in detail. Ferguson for 1959, first he gave the concept of diglossia, model on the French diglossia. The original concept of diglossia goes back to Charles Ferguson in 1959. According to him, the H variety and the L variety have to be two divergent forms of the same language, which are above the level of a standard with dialect distinction, but which stay below the level of two separate related or unrelated languages. Characteristically, the H variety is never used for everyday conversation. And in this respect, a diagnostic situation differs from a standard with dialects situation in which the standard may also be used for everyday conversation. The original description of Diglossia, according to Ferguson, 1959, is diglossia is just the pure definition, first time given by him, is a relatively stable language situation in which, in addition to the primary dialects of the language, which may include a standard or regional standards, there is very divergent, high codified, often grammatically more complex, superposed variety the vehicle of a large and respected body of written literature, either of an earlier period or in another speech community, which is learned largely by formal education and is used for most written and formal spoken purposes, but is not used by any sector of the community for ordinary conversation. That is the first pure, <clears throat> definition of diglossia. And even a chart here, typical case of diglossia according to Ferguson, <coughs> give this example, country in Germany, Haiti, Greece, Arabic nations, H variety, standard German, French, okay, other nations, L variety, Swiss, German, Haitian, okay, Creole, okay, French based Creole language, okay, and other languages, regional varieties of Arabic used in colloquial speech, Egyptian, different uh, area wise languages are called, they are called colloquial. We say colloquial in, uh, in our accent. Okay, then second concept, the same Ferguson concepts was revised by Fishman. In 1967, he said, Joshua Fishman presented a modification of Ferguson's original concept, which he gave in 1959, but Fishman uh, revised it in 1967, a rather strict definition of Deglosia in 1967. He proposed an expansion of Ferguson's definition of Deglosia in two respects. What are two respects? Number one, uh, diagnostic speech, community is not characterized by the use of two language varieties only. There may be more than two language varieties used within a diagnostic community. Number two, according to Fisherman 967, diglossia refers to all kinds of language varieties which show functional distribution in a speech community. Okay, diglossia as a consequence, describes a number of social linguistic situations. From stylistic differences within one language or the use of separate of their dialects. Ferguson standard with dialects, distinction to the use of related or unrelated separate languages. So that he gave the difference between both of them Okay, now you have already understand these, but now we go for code switching. Okay, next question is what is code switching? See here, hello world, marhabal alam in Arabic, in English, hello world. Okay, Urdu we can say, khushamdeed. Okay, 
Chinese language or some other Sia Modo, okay, Chinese Japanese language, Salute Le Mondi, uh, Spanish language. So it's called code switching. Basically, Chamsky believes in universal grammar. He gave the concept that all languages of the world are the same. Okay, so he proved it in his uh, uh, one of the universal grammar concept. Course which is course switching. This morning I hunted my baby to decade babysitter. Lord, do okay. This morning I took my baby to the babysitter. That's the mean Malayan English bilingualism. Then sometimes I will start a sentence in English, give it a meaning in Espano, and finish it in Spanish. Okay, English Spanish bilingualism. Same with English Urdu bilingualism also. Okay. We have in Pakistan. In social linguistics, a language may be referred to as code. A code is neutral term which can be used to denote a language or a variety of language. Code switching is a linguistic phenomenon which occurs in multilingual speech communities. The term describes the process in which a communicatively competent multilingual speaker alternates or switches usually between two languages or language varieties or codes during the same conversation. That's called code switching. In example one, the speaker switches between two codes, Malay and English here. In example, within a single sentence, this particular type of code switching is also called intra-sentential uh, code switching, or code mixing. Intra-sentential code switching defines a change from one code to another code across clauses. Inter-sentential code switching. In example two, look here example to English and Spanish bilingualism. The first clause is in English and the second in Spanish. The linguistic result is a characteristic, okay, hybridization because of the mixing or ling of linguistic elements from two languages within the same sentence or clause. Code switching is often used as a super, a superordinate term, which also includes code mixing. Well, code switching indicates the movement from one code to another in a single interaction. Code mixing specifically <clears throat> designates a mixture between two codes. This causes <coughs> a state of hybridization which can make it difficult to identify which language is actually being spoken. Give me a minute, I can switch off the air condition. We put some irritation in my throat. I have a sound. Okay, again, I'm here. As you can see, my throat was hoarse and I had hissing sound. So I switched off the air condition. Okay. Then again, the last paragraph, you can see code switching as described here is restricted to communicatively competent or skilled bilinguals, multilinguals or multilinguals. It therefore needs to be distinguished from a mixture of languages as performed by unskilled speakers who lack knowledge in a particular code. For instance, language learners who are not yet fully competent tend to fill a lexical gap in their knowledge of the target language, which is called L2, with lexical elements from their native language. Native language is L1. For example, I'm a Pakistani, but I speak my native language, Urdu, I'm speaking L1. 
but when I'm uh, speaking in target language, that's called L2. Maybe it can be English. While, while it's speaking, these switches are motivated by a lack of knowledge in vocabulary and are not defined as code switching. So I give you this example. If you can see the mouse pointer and the code switching in different languages. Central factor involved in code switching. What are the central factors that are involved in code switching? Code selection in multilingual speech communities depends on the situation or domain of use. In general, the speaker's choice between different linguistic varieties in both monolingual and multilingual speech communities is not a random decision, but is motivated by various social factors. The reasons for code switching are very complex. For example, a change in the character of the speech situation, the social context of interaction can affect a speaker's code selection. Thus a change in a particular factor, for example, location, physical setting, participation, participants, or topic can bring about a change in code. This is called situational code switching. A change in the physical setting may trigger a code switch because obviously there is a difference if a speaker has a conversation at home with a close friend or family member, or whether the speaker addresses his or her teacher at school. This example also shows that a change in code happens to account for change status relations between the participants of a conversation apart from signaling status relationships. And addressee dependent codes which can express solidarity. Thus, it can show shared group membership or shared authenticity, ethnicity. A code switch then can be used to emphasize a speaker's ethnic identity. Likewise, a change in conversational topic may trigger a code switch in bilingual or multilingual communities. Certain topics are often typically discussed in one code while other topics are dealt with by using another code. Additionally, code switching may also occur in effective functions. For example, in order to express particular emotional status, states such as anger of annoyance. Sometimes skilled bilingual, uh, bilinguals and multilinguals perform what is termed metaphorical switching, code switching for rhetorical reasons. So then comes domain. I have given this chart, if you can understand, next question is what is domain? If you can see this is domain, red color domain, actual name of this red fox, which is called Wolpus species, among species it's a Wolpus species. So this red fox actual domain was Eukarya. Its kingdom is, okay, in Greek language is uh, Animalia, any is for any animal kingdom, from animal kingdom. And then it's uh, phylum, I mean chordata. Class is mammala, it's a mammal, mammala, called mammalia called in Greek language. Its order is Cornivora. Its family is Canidae. Its genus is Volpus, so that's why its red fox is Volpus. What is the species name? Volpus. So red fox is actually Volpus. Okay, from Volpus, its genus is Volpus, but it is from the domain. The main domain was okay, Eukarya. You try to understand. This is domain mean. Okay. Now the definition of domain. The domain in connection with code switching. The term domain is usually used to denote the social context of interaction. 
The concept of the social linguistics domain goes back to the American social linguist, the Shoah Fisherman. Fishman. Speech communities are made up of a number of domains which organize and define social life. Typical domains in a speech community include family, religion, education, employment, and friendship. Each domain has distinctive domain-specific factors, addressee, setting, and topic. For example, family members are obviously the main addressee in the family domain. The home location would be the setting and everyday family matters would be the topics. These factors influence core choices within domains in such a way that every domain is associated with a particular core variety that is thought appropriate for us, but for use. In bilingual speech communities, in certain domains, one language is used while in other domains, the other language is spoken. Here are a few descriptions of domains of specific language use. They show typical addresses, setting and topic. Look here, domains of language use, family, domain is family, address is parent, setting is home, topic is planning a family party. Domain is religion, addressee is priest, setting is church, topic is choosing the Sunday, okay, liturgy. Domain is education, addressee is teacher, setting is school, topic is solving a math problem. Domain is employment, addressee is employer, setting is workplace, topic is applying for a promotion. In monolingual speech community, situational code switching is done by speaker speaking the varieties of only one language. For example, the choice between standard and non-standard forms of the language, such as standard American English and AAVE. A typical linguistic activity in this connection is style shifting in formal and informal speech situations. In multilingual speech communities, code switching takes place between two or more separate languages. Domain-based code switching in multilingual communities should be distinguished from diglossia. The concept of the domain means that one code is regularly used in particular domains, one set of situations, while another code is regularly used in other domains, another set of situations. This phenomenon is similar to diglossia and can also occur in formerly non-diglossic multilingual speech communities. However, in diglossic speech communities, specializations of function and thus core switching between the H variety and L variety is more institutionalized than the case with regular core switching. That's all about, about core switching. Now comes the next question. What is language birth? Actually, <coughs> well, there are two language birth, pigeon language birth and Creole language birth. Now you have to understand separately what is pigeon, what is Creole language. This section is concerned with description of so-called pigeon and Creole languages. Pigeons and Creole are typically related, referred to as contact languages because they arise from contact between two or more existing languages. More precisely, such languages develop in areas where speakers with different native languages who do not speak and understand each other's languages have contact to each other in specific society or social situation. There is a fundamental necessity for communication between these speech communities, for example, trade. We say that their languages are complementarily distributed in such situation, a common means of communication that is a common language is needed. For example, I go to China, Chinese don't know my language. I don't know Chinese language, they don't know Urdu language, but we can communicate 
in between in english that is not his native language i'm not an english speaker of english but we can communicate the result is the development of language that has not existed before a pigeon or jargon respectively this new language functions as lingua franca now the second name of that this pigeon language created new lingua franca the english is to be spoken as lingua franca all around the world now that's why indian accent is different pakistani accent is different spanish accent of english is different arabic accent is different because used as lingua franca for speakers a language which is used as means of communication between speakers who do not share a native language pidgin languages do not have native speakers the development of pidgins and creoles is not exclusively but closely connected to european colonialist colonialist expansion and its accompanying slave trade this is the reason why we find so many pidgins and creoles located along former trade routes design features of pidgin grammars so this is very important to understand compared to their sources source languages pidgins show a characteristics simplification of linguist structure linguistic structure that concerns all aspect of grammar lexicon phonology syntax semantics morphology accordingly the grammar of pidgins are characteristically less complex than the grammar of their source languages mark saba in 97 describe this reduced structural system by means of four principle of design features ascribed to pidgin grammar some are also very correct these are the four examples here the syntax features of a pidgin reveal a lack of surface grammatical complexity pidgins are characterized by a lack of morphological complexity pidgins do a show a general preference for semantic transparency pidgins show a characteristic reduction in vocabulary number 5 pidgins are characterized by a comparatively high degree of phonological simplicity this is not a design feature mentioned by sebar and seven in 1997 but it is another characteristic feature of pidgin languages this design features are shared by a pidgin by pidgins and creoles worldwide usually contact languages show structural similarities even though they are geographically wide separated and are based on different lexified languages which themselves do not share the structural features that are common to pidgins and creoles what is the example i give one example here talk pisin chinese pidgin english ogasiran tongo english based haitian creole french based okay papi manto spanish based right understand so pidgins here are the important defining features of a pidgin language some examples i have given a pidgin is a language variety that arises from contact between two or more languages within complementary distribution in the context of european colonialist expansion these languages were the languages of european colonizers and the non european indigenous <coughs> languages of those being colonized around the atlantic and the pacific indian oceans west african languages for example languages involved in the formation of pidgin and creole are also referred to as superstrate and substrate the terms are connected to the extent of socio political power ascribed to the groups of speakers in a language contact situation the european colonizers had socio political power and their language 
as the dominant language in context situations. Constitutes the superstrate, the indigenous non-European languages are substrate, which is the less dominant language in a context situation. The speakers of the substrate languages were regarded socially inferior to the youth synchronizers. They had little or no socio-political power. The process in which a pigeon develops is referred to as pigeonization. A pigeon has no native speakers. Pigeons usually draw most of their vocabulary from one language, the lexifier. That's the main source they get the language. The lexifier is usually the language of the European colonizer, English, Spanish, French, Dutch, superstrate. Although they are lexically, grammatically, and grammatically influenced by their input languages, pigeons are not mutually intelligible with these languages. They're very intelligent. They don't know the language very much. Because they are native speakers. Pigeons have grammars which are simplified and reduce a comparison with the grammars of their input language. Mark Seba 97 speaks of typical design features characterizing pigeon and creole grammars. That's all about what is the language birth. I mean, how the birth of pigeon and creole languages. Okay, now we come next question. The last question is question number seven of chapter one, societal multilingualism. Question number seven, what is language and gender research? Language and gender. First, you have to understand this, and then we go for research. I've given one, this one. You see the gender, flexible gender identity is very, very easy. This is a girl, this is a boy. It's a, it's a, it's a female, it's a female. It's a male, it's a female. See my cursor. So which category do you define? Define yourself. I'm a male, I'm in this one. Okay? If this, I'm this one. So <clears throat> just for your understanding, I have this for you. So language and gender. First, you have to understand the basic concept of what is language and gender. The gender pattern, which is explained in the section or on social linguistic pattern, describes phonological differences in female and male speech behavior with respect to the overall frequency of using certain phonological variants. These differences have also been referred to as typical sex-graded variation. Studies in language and gender, however, have a less restricted focus as they are more general concern with gender-based variation as concerns specific female and male ways of speaking, conversational styles and connected discourse features, structuring conversation, lexical differences, etc. The term gender lect is used to refer to the communicative style associated with the particular gender. The term sex and gender in language and gender research is, is now clear here, we think sex is a biological category, denotes biological sex, the, the distinction between female and male defined in a biological term. The classification as male and female is determined by specific biological characteristics at birth. We are born either female or male, or neutral, third gender. So what is the gender? In a, society, in a social category or label, label it describes the socio-cultural concept of what is considered female and male. This concept entails the fulfillment of specific social roles which are typically ascribed to women and men and associated with female and male behavior, gender roles we become socialized as females or males. 
In this process, we learn the rules of female and male behavior which constitute our gender roles and shape our behavior and mindset. So the term sex and gender in language and gender research, how can we define sex is a biological category? I've already told you, okay? Okay, donates biological sex, the distinction between female and male defines the biological terms. Classification as male or female determined by specific biological characteristics at birth. We are born a male or female gender is a social category or label that describes social cultural concept as a male female. This, con con this concept entails the fulfillment of specific social roles, which are men and women, associated with male and female behavior and gender roles. So that's all for today, my dear students. I'm going to stop the screen. Seven questions we have studied. Okay. We can understand. We actually went far. You can see today. BS English Linguistics, Paper 1, Emerging Trends in Social Linguistics, the elective paper, course code ELL416, Chapter 1, Societal Multilingualism. It is the seven questions. What is the first question which we discussed? What is social societal multilingualism? The definition. Okay. Second question. What is this uh, uh, diglossia? Third question. Uh, what is the definition of diglossia by Ferguson and Fishman? Comparison. Fourth question. What is code switching? Okay, and what are the factors involved in course switching? Okay, what is domain is the sixth question. Okay, seventh question, what is language birth? Okay, with regard to pigeon language and Creole language. Okay, and uh, uh, let's see one question of Marsh here. Uh, so the eighth question actually is what is language and gender research? You must understand language and gender first. What is language and gender? And then I discuss with you uh, gender research, okay? I gave you a picture of population with blue and pink color in the last slide, okay? Thank you very much, my good students. Don't forget to subscribe the channel so that you should get message for every new uploaded, uploaded video. And all videos will be, when you click, it will be in order in your account, YouTube. When you open YouTube, you'll find me first if you subscribe. I hope to help you a lot with these free videos for you. Thank you very much and bye-bye.